thank you for coming today. I'm Ashton McGinnis, and I'm from our marketing department. I'm the one that sent you 800 reminder emails, so thank you for being here today and registering and signing up. Uh, we host this event for you, to help you, to guide you forward, uh, and to guide your career forward. So this day is filled with professional development, with keynote speakers, uh, with seminars you can attend. You can get AIA credits here. You can get CTS credits here. Uh, and this is all in service of you. So if there's anything that we can do to make this event better, more applicable to you, please find anybody in an AVI logo uh, and give us your feedback because we're always trying to, to make this experience better and more relevant to your day-to-day -day life. So the first speaker that we have up is our Chief Technology Officer, and he is really a visionary within our company and this industry as a whole. So take advantage of him being here, and he'll be around for questions afterwards. So Brad Sousa. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm always, thank you, I'm always amazed at how many people turn out for a keynote first thing in the morning. So thank you for braving it and coming out and joining us. Um, as Ashton said, I am a Chief Technology Officer at AVI Systems, which means I think I have the best job on the face of the planet. I get to work with the coolest toys, and I get to work with our best customers, and I get to discover new things. And as a result of that, that's where the fun happens for me. So I get to share some of that fun and joy with you today, and I'm looking forward to spending some time together. Before we get going, uh, maybe a couple of points. You can reach me at brad.souza at avisystems.com. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. I post stuff several times throughout the year at uh, LinkedIn slash in at slash Brad Souza. But before we get to talking about the topic at hand, I want to just take a moment and say thank you to some people in this room that are way more important than me. So we've got a lot of AVIers in this room. And uh, I'm glad to see everybody here. We're all family. But also in this room today are some important people. These are our customer partners that are joining us today. And we also have with us this morning some of our vendor partners. And without our customers, we don't have anything to do. Without our vendor partners, we don't have any tools to solve problems. So if you're an AVIer, would you just say thank you to our customers and our vendor partners that are here with us this morning? So everywhere I go, there's a conversation, and I enjoy I talk about it all the time. I enjoy talking about it. But there's always a conversation around what's the coolest thing? What's the next thing happening? What's the widget that's happening? What's happening in the marketplace that we need to be aware of? I love talking about this stuff. And this morning, the topic that we're going to talk about is the best UC idea ever. Are you ready to hear the best UC idea ever? Yeah. OK. So the best UC idea ever is probably a little different than what you would imagine. Uh, together, we talk a lot about widgets and gadgets and platforms and specs and protocols, and all of that stuff's really important. But the best UC idea ever would be an idea that helps us move from OK to amazing. And in fact, every one of us in this room, we are on a journey to this place called amazing. And amazing means something different to different people. If you're a healthcare provider, amazing probably looks to you like improved patient outcomes. Or maybe amazing to you looks like a shorter wait period in the emergency department. And we hear amazing stories. We hear stories around how the technology we provided has saved lives or improved survivability after a procedure, and those are certainly amazing. If you're a federal customer of ours, and maybe you're part of the national security fabric, uh, amazing for you is your ability to accomplish your mission. And uh, we hear stories that tell us, you know, if it wasn't for what the technology you provide, it actually helps influence the balance in world power. OK, that would be amazing, right? And amazing for a lot of our, our corporate customers are really around this idea around adoption. We hear stories of customers that are doing uh, maybe two or 3,000 conferences a month, and now they're doing 25, 30, 35,000 conferences a month across a unified platform. I heard a story the other day that uh, one of our customers did 35,000 conferences across their Skype plus video, mixed video architecture, plus Avaya Voice platform. 35,000 conferences had six 
help desk requests. I would say that's pretty amazing, right? So amazing means different things to different people. And depending on where we are, amazing takes on a different uh, maybe a, a context, but it always ties back to this idea of adoption or consumption. Somehow that's always part of the equation. And we're on this road, on this journey together, you and I are on this journey together to this place called Amazing. And there's a lot of people who have arrived at Amazing. Some of us are already there, others are just beginning the journey. And the question we begin to ask ourselves is, what's the road to Amazing? Are there any express lanes to Amazing? Are there any on-ramps and off-ramps I should be aware of that will get me to Amazing? And while Amazing looks different for different people, one of the things we did is we took time to kind of survey those organizations that have arrived at Amazing and said, are there some things that are common about them? Things that we see that are, are consistent amongst all those organizations that have accomplished this thing called Amazing. And what we learned in our survey was that there are actually three very specific things that are always present at this place called Amazing. One of them is this thing I call the new IT dilemma. And if you heard my keynote, I've been talking about this for a little over a year. I'm going to hit it again because this is what I believe is the single most significant thing, contributor to Amazing. So we're going to talk about that. The second thing is this topic of platforms or ecosystems. This is a huge discussion and, and, a, and, a, and a massive differentiator between OK and Amazing. And the third is BYOW and UCIC. So we're having a technology discussion. We can't have one without having some acronyms. So there's a couple of acronyms for you. Bring your own workspace, unified collaboration, and intelligent communications. We're going to talk about that. Because these three things are present every time somebody arrives at Amazing. So how about we talk about this new IT dilemma? I was uh, speaking at a conference a while ago, and, and after I was done, the next speaker came up and he said, hey, I want everybody in the audience, I want you, if you're a baby boomer, I want you to raise your hand. And there was a group of people who put their hand up. And he said, if you're a millennial, I want you to raise your hand. There was a group of people who put their hand up. And he said, hey, all you boomers, if I say jump, you say, and in one voice, they said, how high? And then he turns to the millennials and he says, raise your hand. He said, if I say jump, you say, and in a unified voice, they all shouted, why? Does this resonate with anybody in the room? So there's this, there's this distinction between the generations just on how you respond to questions and solve problems. And this generational difference is the new IT dilemma. For the first time since the beginning of IT history, back to the days that we used to put tape on mainframes, not me, we, other people who came before me, we, would put tape on mainframe computers and all of that kind of stuff, we have this really interesting cultural dynamic that is centered around this thing of having up to four generations working in the same organization. Four generations of people in the same meeting. Four generations of people solving the same problem. Four generations of people consuming the same technology. And those generational differences are vast. So if you're a traditional, sometimes you might be called a part of the silent generation. Traditionals, you know you're a traditional because if you're a traditional, you remember the Korean War. You remember when technology was this thing called a party line and you did this to get on it, right? Traditionals grew up in an era where war was prevalent and so as a result of that, you sacrificed personally to accomplish a social good. If you're, if you're a traditional, you probably, you might have grown up as a child at the end of World War II and you might have remembered your parents saying, I need gas but I can't buy it today because it's not my turn. This is the whole concept around a traditional generation. Now, if you're a boomer, you remember where you were when man walked on the moon. If you're a boomer, you, you remember when TVs were wireless and telephones were wired. 
So boomers have a different perspective on technology than a traditional does. Now, if you're an Xer, if you're an Xer, you probably remember you, where you were on 9-11. You remember this thing called the internet. And you remember in school having to go to a special room where all of these boxes sat on tables called computers, where you would sit at these things to get on this thing called the internet. And if you're a millennial, well, a millennial, if you say computer, they look at you confused because this is what they think a computer is. And they do most of their compute on this thing. And so the perspective on technology between generations is vastly different. Let me explain what I mean by this. So um, <clears throat> let's say, let's say it's a, we have a traditional conference room. Seats a dozen people, table in the middle of the room, two flat panels on the front wall, camera in between, microphones and speakers, and some sort of control panel in the room, something that we would see every day. A traditional would walk into that room, and they would look at the technology, and they would say, man, that looks expensive. Why do I need that? I've lived without it for all these years. Do I really need that today? And a boomer would walk into that room and say, hey, I can see how that could help me. I'll go find somebody who could teach me how to use that. And an Xer would walk into that room and look at that technology, and they would say, I can see how that can improve my productivity. I'll change the way I work so that I can adopt that. And a millennial will walk into the room, same room, and look at that and say, man, that looks confusing. Can't I just FaceTime and use my iPad or my phone? And so the perspectives on how to consume technology is very different generation to generation. And this is the single biggest impact that separates good from amazing. Because amazing always has to do with adoption and consumption. You cannot separate amazing from consumption. I was having a conversation with a CIO the other day, and some of you might be in this room and you think I'm talking about you, but this conversation happens often. And the CIO was saying to me, you know, Brad, this stuff doesn't work. It just never works. I hear all these complaints about how it doesn't work. And so, you know, I listen to the conversation. I know that's not your stuff. Your stuff always works every time. It's very reliable. But this particular situation, they were struggling with it. And we spent a little bit of time um, investigating what's going on with their systems. And what we learned was that their systems were working as designed, absolutely reliable. The problem is it was designed for the wrong generation. And so millennials would walk into that room, which was a significant part of their user community, and they couldn't figure out how to operate it. Why? Because it was designed for a boomer. The design that they did was actually, if you can imagine this, three to five years old. That's a long time. And so it was designed for a boomer style consumer who would walk in and say, I can find an operator to help me use this. And a millennial would walk into that room and say, this is just way too complicated. The system was actually working. The design was designed for the wrong user community. And because of that, there was a gap. They could not cross that gap. And as a result, they could never arrive at amazing. Does this resonate with anybody in this room? I'm looking, I'm seeing noddings of heads, I'm seeing some rolling eyes. This says to me that this is a common theme because this is one of the conversations that we should be having, but instead we have a conversation around specs and feature sets. Why do we do that? So um, there's this movement today, this transition today from platforms to ecosystems. And the idea is that most of us come from an engineering style background or a technical background, and the language of platforms is specs. So you get, you know, you start comparing specs. And, and let's say we were having a conversation around down selecting to a voice platform. And we're going to down select, we first down select between maybe cloud and on prem, and then we decide we're going to stay on prem. And so we start down selecting between, I don't know. Avaya and Cisco and, and, and uh, Mitel and whoever it is that we want to down select from, right? Or whatever our short list is. And what do we do? We begin comparing specs. Well, you know, H.this is better than SIP that, and 
you know, this has got this capacity and this has got that capacity and, and all of those specs are really important. The protocols are really important, but they're not relevant to arriving at amazing. And the language around platforms is specifications, but the language around ecosystems is use cases and workflows. It's around adoption and consumption. It's all focused on outcomes. What's the outcome we want to accomplish with this? What kind of adoption do we want to create? And this kind of conversation is very different. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. When we talk about specs, as an engineer, I'm very comfortable doing it. I, want, I naturally um, kind of lean and have a bias towards talking about specs because they're unemotional, they're very measurable. I can say good or bad and make a checklist and define my choice. But the reality is, is that I can choose the best protocol and not get the adoption I want. And so I only end up at good and I never arrive at amazing. The concept here is that when we talk about ecosystems, we're actually designing from the edge to the center rather than designing from the center to the edge. Platforms, we design from the center to the edge. And what we say is, I as an engineering team, we as an engineering team have down-selected to this platform. We're going to go with Cisco UCM for Enterprise Voice. Or we're going to go with Microsoft Skype for Enterprise Voice. And what we say then to our users is, this is the platform, you figure out how to use it. But when we talk about ecosystems, we design from the edge in. We learn what the natural motions are from our user community. We learn what their adoption biases are. We learn what they naturally want to consume. And then we design from the edge, the user, towards the center. Now the problem with doing this is that there's no one platform that satisfies even 80% of the user requirements. You now have to have an ecosystem. And in the past, we really viewed Unified often as a single platform that everybody consumes. But today, it's really an ecosystem that satisfies the adoption requirements and the outcomes. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. So let's say I'm a healthcare provider. And as a healthcare provider, I've got a number of user communities and use, user groups and use cases. One of those use cases is around administrative and operational work. And that looks much like any other corporate environment. I might decide I want to use, I don't know, Skype for that, let's say, as my collab platform. And I'm going to use a Microsoft Outlook meeting workflow, and that's going to be kind of the familiar way we invite people in reserve rooms and all of that kind of stuff, which is great. But there's a whole other kind of use case in the same organization that's around patient outcomes. It's around it's around um, providing care within the patient care continuum. And the, and the workers that are involved in patient care and quality of care don't use Outlook. They use a patient record platform, you know, typically something like Epic or Cerner. And so if that's the workflow that they're accustomed to, and you say to them, hey, when a stroke patient presents themselves to the emergency room and you need a stroke consult, all you have to do is get into Outlook and look for the stroke doc and ask for a meeting request. What you've now done is created friction in their normal workflow. And every time we add friction, it reduces the probability of adoption. My single most hated phrase is all you have to do is. Because every time I or somebody else says, all you have to do is, that's code for, I have to have you do something different than what you want to do, and I require you to conform to our technology as opposed to our technology enabling you. So back to this multi-generational thing. If you're an Xer or a millennial, your idea of technology is that it's a business enabler. And because it's a business enabler, it needs to integrate into your normal workflow. It needs, you want it to be part of your natural motions. And 
when all you have to do is is as interrupted into the conversation or inserted into the conversation now I'm creating friction and every time that happens it slows down adoption until I become good but not amazing does this resonate with you anybody in here kind of hearing the message are you facing this kind of challenge as it relates to adoption because this challenge is really addressed when we talk about ecosystems and designing from the edge to the center rather than talking about platforms and designing from the center to the edge. Here's an example of what I mean by this. I was looking for some sort of graphic that would help explain it. So the promise of UC is that there is a unified platform or environment or infrastructure or architecture that we could all consume that would enable us to connect to each other as individuals and teams no matter what device we're on or where we're located at. That's the promise of UC. We would all probably agree to that. But when we start looking at what it takes to actually make that promise a reality, we begin to learn that there's a lot of ecosystems that have to be connected. And in the past, we'd kind of ignore this. We would say to ourselves, oh, you know what? I've got a video platform, and that can operate on its own silo. And I might have a voice platform, and that'll operate on its own silo, but maybe I'll make some, some connections in between the two. And oh yeah, you know our email and meeting invite? Oh, that's really on that Microsoft thing, that Exchange thing. And by the way, what do we do about uh, Active Directory and Dial Schema, and what do we do about, and the list starts going on and on. And, and this is actually a very simplified diagram. Let's start talking about what it looks like when you're looking at hybrid. And you've got both on-prem and cloud. And you can begin to just add more and more logos to this diagram. And pretty soon you realize, you know what? It's not actually a single platform, even though we might want to say it is. It's actually an ecosystem that needs to interoperate together and have one workflow that my user groups can easily consume and adopt. So here's the third thing. We talked about this new IT dilemma. We talked about platforms versus ecosystems. Here's the third thing, and then we'll look at a case study together. The third thing is bring your own workspace. Now this is really interesting to me because most of us have worked through a strategy together, an enterprise strategy around bring your own device. Right? And we say, okay, yeah, you can use your phone and we're gonna have some sort of uh, MDM on it. We're gonna manage that together and all this other kind of stuff, right? And, and we believe that what we've done is address this idea of bring your own device. But in fact, what's happening today is really this idea of bring your own workspace. And the concept is everywhere I am, that's where my office is. So literally within AVI inside our working environment, I, I'm a BYOW guy. Um, wherever I happen to have my, wherever I happen to be, that's where my office is. And it doesn't matter what device, it doesn't matter whether it's this or an iPad or my MacBook or my Windows machine, I get access not only to the people I need to connect with, but also my work product. And I can co-author and develop work product together no matter what device I'm on. This idea around bring your own workspace is this idea that began kind of looking like hoteling, where maybe you wouldn't necessarily have an office. People would arrive at the corporate facility and they might work off-site most of the time. In fact, IDC said that by 2020, 75% of the workforce will be a workforce not working in an office. Some reports I read said as high as 90 to 95% of our workforce by 2020 will have at least some portion of their work day done other than in a formal office. And so bring your own workspace is this idea that wherever I am, I need to be able to connect to people, that's UC, and I need to connect to my work product, that's intelligent communication and collaboration. And so this idea around unified collaboration and intelligent communication is this notion that I'm connecting teams of people that are in conference rooms with individuals that are connected through whatever device they're comfortable with. 
And not only are we connecting people and teams together, but we're also connecting those people with work product. Because they're working on work product before the meeting, they're collaborating and co-authoring during the meeting, and then they're working on work product together as a team after the meeting. And so the question becomes, how do I create a working environment that allows us to bring together this communications capability and this collaboration capability around people and around work product? So these three things we see just about every place somebody has arrived at Amazing. In fact, I can't think of an organization that's really at the top of their performance. They're really driving hard adoption. They're really changing their organization culturally um, that don't have these three things active and growing and expanding inside their, their culture and community. The new IT dilemma, which is around generational views and the impact of technology generationally, the idea of platforms migrating to ecosystems, which is all around use cases, workflows, and adoption, and this idea of bring your own workspace which is supported by unified collaboration and intelligent communications that connects people, teams, and work product together, no matter where you're located at. So what does this look like? If we're able to achieve that kind of amazing thing, what, do, what does it really look like? What do I do with this information? So I want to share with you a case study. So this particular organization is a manufacturing organization located in the Midwest. In addition to their parent company, they have five operating companies. Those five operating companies operate in North America, South America, Asia, Europe, and South Africa. So five continents. They asked us to come in and to do a roadmap session with them and perform some design for them that created a unified collaboration and intelligent communications platform, the UCIC platform. And so we said, let's, let's do a roadmap session and in those roadmap sessions, we want to have sessions that are focused on end users and stakeholders, and we want to have sessions that are focused on technology and have some geeks speak around that. And so they invited, much to our surprise, 125 knowledge workers, stakeholders, and out of the 125 that were invited, 90 showed up. And so in three days, we did 11 sessions that touched five continents and spoke to 90 different stakeholders around how they meet, around how they make decisions happen, how they find people, how they communicate ideas and collaborate together. Our purpose was to define specific user groups and use cases. And with those user groups and use cases, let's then now define workflows, pain points, and discuss obstacles to adoption. And then we said, can we find certain patterns and common expectations amongst these user groups. And then lastly, can we define those patterns and align them against business cases and use that as a foundation for our design? That was our goal. What we learned through the process was that we learned that there were four specific user groups that were very distinct one from the other. They had an executive user group, an administrative user group, a sales and marketing user group, and an operations user group. And each of these user groups had one or more of these four use cases involved in their average everyday meeting work style. There's an informational policy meeting, which was tended to be a leader talking with subordinates. There was a status and team meeting, which was leader to subordinate, but it was collaborative. They shared information back and forth, and they statused each other. There was a problem-solving meeting, which was completely horizontal. There were no titles in any of those meetings. There were only skills and experiences. And that was fully collaborative, horizontally, amongst the organization. And they had training meetings, which were one-to-many style communications, an expert speaking to a group. And that needed to also be collaborative. And much of that content was consumed on demand, not just live. So here's what we did. We took their use cases and their user communities and we put them on what we call a meeting experience continuum. <clears throat> and when you look at the meeting experience continuum, you look at this axis here going up and down at the top, what you have are meetings that are very interactive. And on the bottom are meetings that are meant to be, I'm gonna give you this information, I just need you to absorb it. 
and going across the horizontal axis on this side are meetings that are all around information and on this side are meetings that are all around entertainment and entertainment might seem kind of funny but we've done this with a number of consumer goods manufacturers and entertainment is actually quite um, meaningful to them especially around sales conferences and product announcements and I'm going to roll out a new model of a car that's a very entertaining experience and so what we learned was as we began to plot these different meeting styles and expectations there were actually three groups there is a group right here that was all around team meetings and problem solving highly collaborative there's this group here that was really all around sharing and disseminating information I need you to catch this I don't need to have a lot of comments back from you and then there was this group right here which is really all around training one to many and when you begin now to see that these different user communities have common expectations but the expectations are not the same you can realize now that one design does not fit all you need to have a design that is capable of, of, pro of providing the same basic technology to all users but it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of design architecture so the idea that we um, we ended up working with them on was this concept of uh, bringing together their voice platform which was largely a Cisco UCM platform for their large facilities and a Nortel TDM PBX for the smaller facilities we brought together for them multiple different video platforms and consolidated that in their case on a Polycom Real Connect video platform and then they had a hybrid version of, of uh, Skype they had both uh, Skype on-prem as well as O365 and what we did I know this may look a little complex but what we did was we centered this around a common workflow and their common workflow was a Outlook meeting invite and so I would send you an Outlook, Outlook meeting invite I would use Outlook to reserve my conference rooms and invite my people and then you would decide how you wanted to join if you were on a mobile device or a compute platform you click to join and you entered into the Skype world if you're in a conference room you click to join it showed up in your meeting calendar and you tap the calendar event the meeting event and it brought that video conferencing endpoint into the video domain and if you were a voice user you dialed the phone number and put the conference ID in and for them their status meetings this is this happens to be their status meeting use case their status meetings also included vendors and customers so some of those were federated Skype users and some came in via Skype guest and everyone landed on their own domain the video users landed in the video domain the Skype users landed in the Skype domain the voice users landed in the voice domain and they were all unified together able to see speak to one another and share content and work on common work product so this idea for them was that we learned the path of least friction was this Outlook meeting invite and if we use that as the unified workflow we could create an ecosystem across these multiple platforms and that ecosystem is what enabled them to achieve amazing how amazing this is amazing so this is the kind of ROI that we sat down and said at the beginning of our journey together we believe that this is the kind of ROI we should be aspiring to so we think you're going to invest around two and a half million dollars a year for the next three years and we think you're going to at max um, adoption achieve something around a 16 million dollar annual return on investment now this might sound kind of crazy <clears throat> and in fact often when we present an ROI story like this the first response is that's amazing but it's unbelievable and so we sit down and go through the metrics and we explain that these metrics are not ours they're industry standard metrics that are being applied to this specific technology in your current environment and your current culture would you like us to hire a third party to come in and validate this for us we'd be happy to do that because we want a benchmark we want to show that we're on our way to amazing and what we discover along that journey is that we find some very incredible things when you when you address the generational differences you look at an ecosystem and design it from use cases to the center and you enable people to connect to each other as individuals and as teams as well as to their work product no matter where they're at there's some powerful powerful transformation and I shared one earlier 2,500 conferences to 35,000 conferences in two and a half years that's a real statistic and that's not just one account that happens over multiple accounts that's the kind of transformation 
we have learned to begin to expect and design for. So, what do we do with all of this? Well, here's my recommendation. First of all, I want to say thank you for giving me time together this morning and for joining us. But as we're spending the day together, I would ask you to do a couple of things. One is, would you have a conversation with your AVI account manager and ask them about this roadmap process and say, how, on the, on the scale of good to amazing, where do you think we are together and how do we get to amazing? And when you're talking with our vendor partners and you're on the show floor and you're looking at some of the coolest stuff that's on the market today, we're going to have this tendency to talk about specs and features, and let's do that. But after we do that, let's ask our good vendor partners, what can this really do to transform my organization? How does this help me arrive at amazing together? Because all of us are on the same journey. We all want to arrive at that same place. And we're motivated to actually walk that journey with you and help us all arrive at amazing. Thank you for giving me your time this morning. I'll be around today. I'd love to have a conversation with you about this. Have a great day.